Hello, friends. Uh, on behalf of Center for the Study of Developing Societies, I, Hilal Ahmed, welcome you all. Uh, today's seminar is an interesting one, and uh, it is on secular Islam in the life and writing of Sayyid Abid Hussain by Razak Khan. Uh, Razak is a research fellow at Center for the Modern Den Studies, University of Gottingen. He is currently working on his second book project, Minor Cosmopolitanism, The Life and Writings of Sayyid Abid Hussain. And I suppose that this presentation is based on that. His first book, Minorities Past, Locality, Emotions and Belonging in Princely Kanpur, Rampur, sorry, was published by OUP in 2022. So without any further delay, over to you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Ahmed, for the invitation and for organizing this. And my apologies for the delay in arrival. Uh, I had forgotten that Delhi in Diwali is not just polluted, but also extremely busy on the road. So with that due apology, let me begin. So there exists a rich scholarship on India's first Prime Minister, Pandit Jawala Nehru's writing and vision of modern and secular India. However, not much attention has been paid about Nehru's relationship with Islam and Muslims in the years after the partition of British India. So this chapter, which forms part of a larger project, uh, looks at Nehru's vision of modern and secular Indian Islam and his governmental policies towards creating one. Uh, it also examines the response and agency of Indian Muslims as exemplified by the life and writings of Sayyid Abid Hussain. Perhaps we could go to the next slide and show the image of Habit uh, Next one. Yeah, so this is Abit Sab in his late years. Uh, despite the partition's long shadow, Nehru's assigned the Ministry of Education to Maulana Bulkla Mazad. He was not on the only exemplary, quote-unquote, Indian nationalist Muslim in the Nehruvian Republic. Azad was also surrounded by other leading Muslim intellectuals, including Zakir Hussain, Abid Hussain, Muhammad Mujib, K.G. Sayyidan, Humayu Kabir, Khwaja Ahmed Abbas, those of you who follow films would know of him, among others. These were key actors in the larger educational as well as the culture sphere under Nehru's government. My colleague Shirupa Roy, in her insightful study of the Nehruvian Republic, has examined a series of documentaries commissioned by the Films Divisions, Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. Roy lists documentaries, a series of specific documentaries on Islam and Indian Muslim. Some of the titles in this series are Muslims in India, A Muslim Festival in Secular India, Centers for Islamic Studies, Aligarh Muslim University, and Jamia Milia Islamia. Based on a study, Roy argues that, and I quote, that even in the golden age of Nehruvian secularism, then the light of Indianness shown in a selective and partial element as encounters with the nation state consistently illuminated some experiences of national belonging and obscured others. So these documentaries constitute an official nation state archive of what I call how to become an Indian nationalist Muslim or how to become a nationalist Muslim institution. So in this chapter, I try to highlight the discourse and policy around Islam and centers of Islamic studies uh, to create a modern and secular Muslim subject and an educational institution in post-colonial India. Following Amir Mufti, I want to examine the discourse about minority as also a discourse about nationalism and by that logic, majoritarianism. While nationalism produces minoritization, but a minority also represent an alternative perspective on nationalism. However, post-colonial Indian nationalism needs to be also situated in the more extensive global history of Cold War politics around culture and nationalism. Uh, and, and a particular focus of mine is a new formulation about study of Islam. Uh, particularly at the university level. So it is this intersection between the national and global that I want to highlight. So 
instead of thinking of nationalist Indian Muslim as a debate within nationalism or nation state, it might be more fruitful to look at the global genealogy of that category's emergence. Um, so in the abstract, I wrote that I'll be discussing the book Destiny of Islam, uh, but maybe I could give a background to another book that I think needs to be read together with Destiny of Indian Muslim, which is a post-partition book. But Abid Hussain also wrote another book called The National Culture of India. Now, this book has at least four different editions and four different lives. Uh, and what, just because of the brevity of time, I would try to show is how the process of minoritization represent different moments in India's own historical relationship with Muslim pre-partition, but I think the discourse is in fact not minority, but as an equal debate on the nature of nation state and how that undergoes subtle and profound changes post-partition. So I look at four different version or edition of this book. I will then try to read the destiny of Indian Muslim as a discourse, not so much about future with the title Destiny in it, but the book National Culture of India is an elaboration of India's past. So what are ways in which past and future are connected in this uh, intellectual uh, work that Abid Hussain is doing? And lastly, I want to look at two practices of secular uh, secularism as a method or an everyday affect of the state. Uh, that is has to be not just be articulated in text, but needs to be both institutionalized, but also practiced in everyday life. So for this, I look at the uh, Abid Hussain subsequently set up a society called Islam in the Modern Age Society and the journal with the same name in Jami Mili Islamia. Um, and in the, the interesting thing about both of these initiatives is Although within the existing historiography, they're seen as initiative within Jamia, once you start looking at the archives of those texts, they're profoundly global in both uh, the material that they're engaging with, but also the actors involved in as intellectual interlocutors. So if we can go to the next slide. Yeah. So I want to introduce you to the first global actor here. He's a German supervisor of Abid Hussain. So Sayyid Abid Hussain had studied in Germany, Berlin in 1920s with the famous German philosopher educationist, Edward Spranger. Spranger was an influential figure in the debate around culture, youth policy, and education in the Weimar era, Berlin. And there's a way in which I believe the text, National Culture of India, is a, also a dialogue with debate around minority and national culture in Germany. For the sake of brevity, we'll move to the context of not 1920s, but in 50s, because Abed Hussain not only did his PhD with Spranger, he retained a connection with him even after he moved to India. So the interesting thing in 50s, when Abed Hussain got actually a Rockefeller grant to translate this book, which was initially written in Urdu into English, he decided to go back to Germany and revise this book at uh, Tübingen University, where Spranger had retired. Now, this revision of the text funded by Rockefeller Foundation is interesting also because Rockefeller Foundation also funded the famous Pakistani nationalist historian Ishtia Qureshi's book, uh, which came up with the complete opposite analysis of Islam in South Asia. So there's a way in which we can look at emergence or re-emergence of these texts in post-40s, uh, post-Second World War as a global interest and reframing on role of Islam in South Asia. It's also got to do with Cold War interest on role of Islam in shaping politics in South Asia. I want to be brief, but perhaps what I could summarize here is that the National Culture of India, once it was written in, and translated into English, subsequently won the Sahitya Academy Award. It's 1956. But this text in its original formulation was in fact quite critical of uh, the way the debate around nationalism was being conducted in pre-partition. Uh, so in its earlier variation, it was in fact speaking from a discourse of parity. 
of how the future national culture would be created, what would be the place of Muslim in that comparison. So it's also interesting that in its initial uh, form uh, dedication, the, the it was supported initially by the Nizam of Hyderabad. It was also dedicated actually to Iqbal among other people. But in post 1950s edition, that dedication changes. It's now Tarachan, who was one of the nationalist historian promoted by Nehru, and whom also Abid Hussain shared a relationship through Allahabad University and the Hindustani Academy, for which he had worked with him. So this change of dedication is not the only change. You see a complete reworking of the text. He adds two to three new chapters. The major thing, and this is where the German influence, I think, is central, is that he emphasized the role of creating a new youth policy uh, in which the teacher should be involved, particularly to harness the restlessness among quote-unquote youth in post-partition context. Uh, Abed Hussain had also translated a German text by Spranger called the Sociologie des Jugendalters. It's a German text about youth psychology, and its only translation exists in Urdu. Uh, so there's a long-term investment in thinking about youth politics and restlessness and how to integrate that into uh, for nation purposes. Um, a third variant of this text would come in the late 1950s when uh, Hussein would be posted in Aligarh University. And there this text would emerge again as a general textbook uh, for teaching for wider population and there it becomes the Indian nation culture. So there are different titles that are coming, there are different politics around that text. Now, this move to Aligarh is significant because uh, the scholars associated with Jamia, not least Zakir Hussain, would be moved from Jamia to Aligarh under Nehru's policy of quote unquote nationalizing, secularizing Aligarh, which uh, was seen as in post partition context uh, something that needed let's say reform, that's the terminology there, or integration. Um, the discourse around integration is not just political integration. There's a huge emphasis on what they call emotional integration and a discourse around quote unquote loyalty circles. So, so although this sounds a debate about emotion, it is actually a practice around secularism. So there's a lot of this discussion and I was just seeing that Professor Menon, Nivedita Menon has just come out with a new book on secularism. So one of the things I want to suggest in this paper is secularism is not just a state practice. It also has to be embodied and not just institutionalized, but also embodied in a very affective way. How do you make people loyal? And of course, the seminal text on Muslim loyalty is Hunter Commission's report on the disloyalty of the Indian Muslim. So there's a long-term genealogy of this debate and how this needs to be not just institutionalized, but practice. So textbook, the, the revision of this text into a textbook is interesting precisely for that reason. How long are we doing with time? So, okay. so one of the points, and I'll try to summarize this, I have argued that the discourse of culture and it is not just culture, it's national culture uh, that is so central in this book has to be also read alongside the German debate on the culture debate. But the culture debate, to summarize, is also a reading of culture, not just as religious culture embodied, let's say, as Islamic or Jewish culture, but culture as a domain of nation, something that the nation needs to be heavily invested in. So that's why the debate around national culture uh, becomes interesting. So there's an interesting way in which one could read uh, Hussain's uh, effort to read both Tehzeeb and Tamadun, just to come to the actual translational politics from Urdu into English and German, where, you know, Hussain was a very, very prolific translator. He had worked with Anjuman Itaraki board, with Abdul Haq. He was, in fact, the main force behind the Urdu dictionary. He has translated, in my opinion, he's the only major translator from German into Urdu. So there is a way in which 
he had a particular uh, ability to translate not just literally but conceptually from languages that were not traditionally in dialogue with Urdu. Here, why I want to, of course, refer to Kavita Datla's seminal work on Urdu as a secular language of secular Islam being created at Usmania. And of course, Abid Sahib, before he got heavily involved with Jamia, uh, Maktaba Jamia and Urdu Academy, had worked for Usmania. He had actually created a first textbook on sociology and anthropology, again, written by a German convert to Islam, Omar Rolf Ehrenfels. So there are a variety of German texts that he has translated, both for Usmania as well as uh, for Maktaba Jami and subsequently actually also for Sahitya Academy. He translated Goethe's and Kant's critique of pure reason into Urdu, a fact that is so mind-boggling because Kant in its original formulation is itself so difficult. So to translate Kant's critique of pure reason into Urdu is quite a significant feat. But the point I'm trying to make there is to think of translation also as an intellectual exercise. How do you translate concept and theories that have come in an entirely different context that probably carry majoritarian knowledge and politics for a minority practice? And this is where the project is called Minor Cosmopolitanism, deriving precisely from the fact that how do we look at minority intellectuals' engagement with majoritarian concept? Do those concepts change when done by a minority, both in its own language, but actually in the language of the majority? So in this paper, I want to suggest two things. Uh, both the discourse and the category of secularism, as well as majoritarian democratic tradition or democracy itself or nationalism needs to be reread or at least revisited when they are being employed by minority intellectuals. Um, and indeed, I want to make an argument that in Hussain's understanding, democracy and secularism in India was a minority project. It was never going to be safe in the hand of majority. And therefore, he insisted that Muslims must see secularism not as an aberration to their history, but it is their destiny. They should be involved in this precisely because that both democracy and secularism in the hand of majority are never going to survive. So it's, 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 it's an important argument to be made before we debunk there's a lot of debate on both these concepts. And one of the ways to think of these concepts as not, even though they may be majoritarian, there's a historical tradition which minority has engaged with this. This is, of course, the work on Deleuze and Guattari, looking at Kafka's relationship with German. And it's, it's, it's a matter of great debate within uh, you know, the field of German Jewish studies, for example. So with that larger point, I want to come to Hussain's engagement with uh, the field of Islamic studies and how he sort of goes about uh, exploring and creating uh, a system which is uh, an, an engagement with the nationalist project, the Nehruvian nationalist project. Yeah. Okay, so the destiny of Indian Muslim. So the destiny of Indian Muslim is a call for dialogue with Indian Muslim to engage with modernity, secularism, and nationalism. So Abid Hussain acknowledges, unfortunately, I don't have an image, uh, but Abid Hussain here introduces another important global actor in the study of religion. Those of you who are into the discipline of religious studies would be familiar with Winfred Cartwell Smith, Actually, he's also a historian who then becomes famous as a religious studies person. So very few people know now because Smith goes through profound career and intellectual changes from being a missionary to a communist to an institution builder. Smith's earlier work was in fact in Lahore. He had taught at the Christian Formal College there and had in fact written the only comparative study of Aligarh Jamia and Osmania. 
So this is his earlier work that people uh, don't talk so much about. And in that book, he had come up with the idea that Jamia is going to represent the future of Islamic studies. So he sort of actually said of the three universities, his most, he kept his hope with the Jamia model. And he said it for two reasons, because Jamia's initial founders after the initial stage was particularly in 20s, had all studied in Germany and they were all trained in various other departments, economics, history and uh, education, among others. So he had a hope that Jamia has the best combination of being a both authentically Muslim university, but also profoundly Europeanist or global in its understanding. So actually, Abid Hussain acknowledges Smith's contribution in the making of this text. So the destination, the destiny of Indian Muslim was published uh, after Nehru's death. And in some way, carries an elaboration of Nehru's vision and its possible afterlife after Nehru. Uh, so it carries, of course, a deep imprint of the Nehruvian discourse and practice of secularism. Uh, I find Hussein extremely interesting uh, because he is able to bring philosophy, psychology and history in a very interesting uh, dialogue. And his, his usage of language, both in Urdu and English, is extremely analytical. So the three parts of the book are called The Shadow of Yesterday, The La Twilight Today, and Tomorrow, Dark or Bright. Uh, and I'll come to the last part where he connects them with the dream analysis. Uh, so the first part lays the historical background. The second poses the problematic and the third offers a possible solution. So the book, of course, opened up with the, the dire situation or the strange contrast between integration and lack of it. And I'm quoting him here. So political convergence coupled with social and cultural divergence has defined this historical moment. The appearance of integration vocabulary was not just about national or political integration, as I said before, but also about emotional integration to solve the minority question in post-partition India. Now, Hussain starts by writing about Muslim intellectual history and various responses to modernity and nationalism question in colonial India. And he identifies three responses there. One was of secular communalism, religious nationalism, and secular nationalism. In his mind, these were embodied by Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, Iqbal, and Badruddin Tayyibji. At the same time, he critiques Sir Sayyid's model and his followers for failing to respond to Indian nationalism and secularism, and Congress Muslim and nationalist Muslim for collapsing into what he called a political-religious mentality. And he writes greatly about Muslims and minority politics in the book and about the discourse on minority separatism and integration debate. Hussein's own understanding of the word minority is multidimensional, and he analyzes various ways of conceptualizing minority politics, but he finds this framework limiting because minority politics is based on an estrangement, fear and hatred. For Hussein, minority politics had uh, apart from political, also psychological and spiritual dangers for minority subject formation, creating what he calls a feeling of insecurity, a complex of persecution, and a habit of self-pity. These are his words, which can only lead to what he calls demoralization, mental stagnation, and resentment against life, which leads to cultural stagnation. Or I think the word he uses is cultural death. So in his chapter of nationalism, patriotism, and internationalism, uh, he comes up, I'm sorry if I'm going into too many details, but it's important to sort of look at how he's working with the categories. So he works with the category of internationalism in two ways. He sort of put it into discourse with Islamic discourse of universal brotherhood and connect Islam, in fact, as a source of globalization and internationalism. So instead of seeing this in a discourse of Omar, he would then start sort of reading Islam within a historical unraveling of modernity's own and, uh, movement. So for him, therefore, secularism uh, represent uh, 
unraveling of modernity as in a historical process, excuse me. And in that way, he argues that Islamic history is in that sense a history of deep participation in that process of evolution of modernity. And the, the thing that he cites as the best example of that Muslim participation is translation. And this is not surprising given his own interest in translation. And he says, it is precisely Muslims' role as the translator between Greek and Roman knowledge and its translation in global dissemination that they have to see themselves as a carrier of modernity rather than in opposition to modernity. So for him, he sort of sees these good categories as not in religious term, but as historical evolution. And at, by that logic, he connects modernity not in opposition, but precisely also a historical evolution of Islam itself. By making this part of the global or at least historical evolution of um, modernity, Hussein is able to not frame this as a debate about religion, but as a debate about historical evolution of both religion and nation state. Um, in, his, in the chapter called Fundamental Decision, then he talks about what Muslims should do to deal with both the question of modernity and its two major uh, in categories, nationalism and secularism. He sort of identifies what he called a journal feeling of despair, particularly in post context of the partition, where Muslims have sort of given up this idea that they have any stake left there. And he sort of invites them to actually see this not just as something that they don't have a stake, but they are in fact the main carrier of this uh, project, the Nehruvian secular project. And he invites them to actively participate in this. But in doing so, he also, um, it's not directly referenced, but you can see that he's also engaging in critiquing two others model. One is of course the religious model uh, and he doesn't say it very openly but he's of course invested in a more secular university based idea of islam uh, but in that understanding also he differs strongly at least in a subtle way with the communist internationalist model so i think the other person that is cited is km ashraf and his model of thinking of uh, Muslim internationalism. Ashraf, of course, was the poster boy of Nehruvian Muslim Reach Out project. And although he didn't have an official falling out, it's quite evident that Nehru gave up on him in post-partition context. And I'm afraid communists too did. So he ended up being in Berlin and was left with neither being an Indian Muslim or a Pakistani Muslim. So that's another story uh, and that needs further studies. Uh, but I, I guess uh, what Hussein is, is partly referring is a critique of the communist take on Muslim and the Pakistan question. So he's suggesting that even those progressive internationalism model are not going to actually help the Muslim cause. Um, so therefore, he's suggesting that Muslim needs to actually take over the narrative and participate in this project of nation and secular project building um, and they have to find that language themselves. Uh, so he's sort of, uh, I wouldn't call him anti-communist, but I would certainly call him being critical of the communist model and its resolution on the Muslim and Pakistan question. Okay, I'm going to now quickly move if, to the practices of secular affect, but uh, just because I find this section so beautifully written. So the epilogue of the book is actually called title, A Desire and a Dream. So Hussein state, and I'm using the word analysis in a psychoanalytical way. So Hussein states very analytically, and I quote, desire is more often for the unattainable rather than the attainable things. Hussein's desire for Islam in the modern age was connected with the hope that India was the perfect, and I quote him, exuberant garden enriched by the sweat and blood of Muslim which provided it the ground for such a hope to materialize into a reality. And this is an argument Smith also make actually that 
the only possible ground for a truly secular polity as well as a secular reading of Islam is not actually possible in Pakistan. It's only possible in India where Muslims are in minority. So both Smith and Hussain see minority as a possibility, not as a problem in the intellectual sense of the labor. So Mushirul Hassan has written on destiny of Indian Muslim and Sayyid Abid Hussain and he calls it essentially the destiny of Indian Muslim as essentially a forecast of possibilities. And he writes of Hussein as someone who occupied an important place as building bridges between religious faith and promoting a liberal version of Islam. Now, this reading is, of course, also in response to Mushir Hassan's own historical evolution and the way in the time that he was writing, and I think his work in the 90s has to also be read in response to what was politically happening. But uh, for me to read Hussain within a project of nationalism is not an incorrect, but it is certainly a partial reading because it sort of undercuts Hussain's global genealogies. Yeah. So just to sort of point at those global genealogy, I want to draw your attention to his work in his later years on building what I call a secular Islam or institutionalizing modern Islamic studies. So I think I'm going to skip on Smith, who is an important person. But just so that you know why Smith is so important is because Smith in post-Second World War context becomes extremely important as an institution builder so he is the head, he is the founding head of the Institute of Islamic Studies at McGill. Very important institution in post war study of Islam. Uh, and it's set up in 1952. He was also the director of the Center for Study of World Religion at Harvard. This is 1960s. Now, why is this institution building in North America important? Because, of course, Smith didn't stop at that. He was also heavily involved in institution building in India. So Smith was in touch with, I believe, Dr. Rajni Kothari in 1960s, and they collaborated on a university grant commissions project on the setting up of a department of comparative religion. The first department of comparative religion uh, was institutionalized actually at the Punjab University in Patiala. And why does a study uh, department on comparative religion becomes important? Because the idea was that Islam and other religions particularly uh, needs to be studied in its multi-religious context, also in relationship with Judaism and others. Uh, so this is a larger debate about emergence of the discipline of comparative religion. That's what I meant when I said that the, the discourse and study of religious studies is actually extremely political. It's not a discipline only about theology. It's very much embedded in post-Cold War institution building. Okay, so it is in this slide that we have to study the emergence of the Institute of Islamic Studies, both at Aligarh and in Jamia. Actually, the one in Aligarh comes under Zakir Hussain Chancellorship. This is, uh, so Nehru appointed him there in the 40s, and in 1954, already an effort for modern Islamic studies department were made. This, of course, was heavily criticized in the parliament, and the only archive of this is a complaint that comes in parliament saying, why is the government paying for an Islamic studies department? Uh, and of course, here, so that's the archive which I was able to do. Unfortunately, one of the problem of studying post-colonial India is an extreme lack of interest in institutional archives. So we don't have those kind of archives available. It would have been fascinating to see who are the people who are being invited. But what I could figure out was Dr. Abdul Alim was an important actor here. Uh, he, he, along with Zakir Hussain, had traveled to various countries, including Beirut, Damascus, Ankara, and Cairo. So they, they are then set on the, to these two. And of course, Nehru is also using this for his foreign policy. And subsequently, all these visiting uh, political leaders would be brought in to see this department. Uh, 
the institutionalization of this, of course, in Jamia is named after him. So the Zakir Hussain Institute of Islamic Studies in Jamia comes in 1970s. And here, I believe Abid Hussain played an important role, both through his Islam and the Modern Age Society and the journal Islam or Asad Jadi, which is published both in Urdu and English. Uh, one point I was interested in exploring is again, unlike Zakir Hussain, Abdul Alim's journey into the Western Asian countries, Hussain does a completely different journey. He goes to Germany and he's particularly interested in the German tradition of Islam Wissenschaft, modern Islamic studies, which itself is a heavily German Jewish tradition. I have elsewhere written about the presence of three German Jews uh, who taught actually at Aligarh, Usmania, and Jamia. So he's particularly interested in engaging those scholars. And what the scholar he engages with, of course, is Anna Marie Schimmel. So Anna Marie Schimmel, of course, was also in working with Smith at Harvard, but at this stage, she was in Bonn as a young scholar, soon developing interest in South Asia. So actually, Schimmel was actually earlier not working on South Asia, but once she meets these people, her later career completely changes, and she's completely fascinated with Iqbal and also Sindhi poetry. So uh, it's a very interesting genealogy. And Shemel then joins the Islamic Islam in the Modern Age Journal. She's one of the advisors, and there's a lot of exchange of letters that you can see in her collection in Basel in Switzerland, and as well as the Premchand Archive in Jamia. I think I'll leave some of the finer detail of the policy that uh, the Islam in the Modern Age Society comes up with uh, for discussion, if you, if you would be more interested in that. Uh, just, just want to quickly flag another archive of this. Uh, the writing of Abid Hussain are diverse, but the one in the journal newspaper Nai Roshni are significant here where he's writing about Muslims and the current issues uh, and he sort of, in that, again, sort of tries to make wider dissemination in population and the university student uh, so to rethink the relationship between Islam, modernity, and secularism in particular. I think um, I'm going to now conclude. So Sheila McDowell has argued about Abid Hussain that his perspective, and I'm quoting her, his perspective was not doctrinaire. It was rather like that of the fathers of an ecumenical movement in the Christian case, namely an expression that when persons seriously meet each other, their misconception may disappear and new grounds for agreement may emerge. So this true spirit of religion, or what she calls the Indian spirits, is a crucial aspect of uh, Hussein's life and writing in the volume Islam in Transition, uh, the authors have actually compared destiny of Indian Muslim with Maududi's law and constitution and how these two texts, which was also written in 19, oh, that came early, 1955, but they both post partition texts. And they argued that both of them represent two different responses to secularism and nationalism con project in India and Pakistan. They cite Hussein as an example of critical engagement with Islam, nationalism, and secularism. How, however, it is important to note how Hussein frames and resolves the, these questions by comparing Indian nationalism and secularism as part of what he calls the modern world culture. And by that framing, he uh, sort of urges Muslims to be not just be followers of it, but be an active participant of this project. Uh, what he calls the scientific secularism project. Further, he brings affinities between secular constitutional value and Islamic values like brotherhood, social economic justice, and equality. This parity between nation and religion raises the question of loyalty as an emotion and a practice, and is therefore resolved through the discourse of different circles of loyalty and emotional integration. Hussein's navigated these varied domains from the formal study of Islam in modern Islamic studies. The Journal of Islam in the Modern Age becomes an important archive, therefore, of 
therefore, of this elaboration, the Nehru, the Nehruvian nation state and its policy and legacy under Indira Gandhi's are, of course, a different story, and which, of course, leads to her turn more towards the urban, with this particularly the urban and Muslim clerical class, uh, which, of course, eventually, if not directly, leads to Rajiv Gandhi's eventual decision on the Shabano case. Uh, however, instead of just reading this as one narrative of Congress and Muslim, I think it's important to unpack it and see this. So Indra is not truly Nehru's successor in that sense. She's her own person and she has her own mind on this. Um, the task also remains to understand the role of Muslims in engaging with this discourse and not just see them as just Congressy Muslim or a follower of that discourse. Uh, Beyond the category of separatism and integ integration, we have to also rethink both the history of crisis and possibility of Muslim politics in post-colonial India, and the and the fact that Muslim, at least in Jamia, Muslim intellectual in Jamia, always had this sense that because they were from the very beginning involved with Gandhi during the Khilafat phase, they there is a very interesting discourse or a comparison can be made between the Khilafat as the first elaboration of Hindu-Muslim unity project under Gandhi to Shaheen Bagh, where one of the argument, of course, it is used pejoratively, the Khilafat to Shaheen Bagh, but one of the ways to think of the Shaheen Bagh movement, and of course, it's not a Jamia movement, it is slightly away from Jamia, there's a class element, but one of the ways to think of how Abid Hussain would have responded to the emergence of this movement and I'm speculating, he would not be surprised because in his mind, the ma the real Satyagrahi is a minority subject. I'll include with that. Thank you very much Pita, for this fascinating presentation. Uh, I have a couple of points to make, but uh, I think at last. So the floor is open for questions and comments. Take mic because we are live. Hey, uh, so I'm curious to know uh, what was the local reception of his writings? Like how it was? His, uh, I mean, I I read uh, long back uh, his Urdu writing on, mm -hmm. on uh, his uh, both of the books which you discussed in detail. Yeah. So how was it received locally? Locally means uh, both in the English press and also Urdu press. Yeah. This is a part I'm trying to research. I'm actually just coming from the Prem Chand archive. Um, this is a bit of a problem because unfortunately, a lot of this has not been preserved. So I'm hoping some of the reviews, uh, I believe there was one review of uh, at least the national culture of India, but it's not by Indian scholars. I think it is probably by, by Smith. The, the book, of course, received the award uh, and it was published by National Book Trust, multiple edition, multiple translation too. What interests me is not so much the reception, but the different versions, because it's not such a big book pre-partition. It becomes a huge book in 50s, and then it is transformed into a general text at Aligarh. So I think the question of reception is also about what is the political function, or at least intellectual function, that it is being asked to serve. I was quite fascinated by the different dedication and how Iqbal disappears post partition. Uh, but of course, Abid Hussain has not disowned Iqbal. He is one of the most important Iqbal scholar. His brother-in-law, K.G. Sayyidin, was a, also a very important Iqbal scholar. And I think one of the reasons Smith was in touch with him was also because of Iqbal. Uh, so I don't have a real answer in terms of... It might be worthwhile. I'm hoping to go to Alikad and Rampur. And, you know, you have to see the Urdu Risala, which unfortunately are not here. But in the English press, this 
this. I think it still is published. I believe there are still edition of this books available. So in the mainstream, it is of course seen as a canonical nationalist text. Uh, but it, your question is an important one within the Urdu one. Zakir Hussain, of course, thinks very highly of Abid Hussain. He wrote his forward to, I was just looking at another book that Hussain has written, fascinating one called The Way of Gandhi and Nehru, where he's comparing Gandhi and Nehru. In fact, two chapters are called Gandhi or Nehru or Gandhi and Nehru. So he's he's a Gandhian Muslim writing in Nehru's time. So that makes him a very interesting figure. But I would say his the book has an interesting history. The reception of it would merit more research. Yeah. Questions? Mike, we are we are live. Just as a point of curiosity, you said the connection with Spranger went on later. So I was just wondering in what ways, and you did talk a bit about it. If you could just elaborate a little yeah. more. So the first connection, of course, is as a supervisor, and he wrote his thesis with him. Oh. Then he in twenties would translate the psychology of youth text. Um, then he keeps in touch with him through letter. And I have to say, it is really Hossein. Spranger is actually has a very complex history and he's not a very likable person, actually. Uh, so I'm not going to give him much credit for that connection. But Hossein is interested, I think, not just in him, but Spranger's location in post-war Germany. So I think the choice is not just because he wanted to only be with Spranger. Spranger is a very grumpy old man by then. <laughs> I don't think he played a very important role in the text. But I think Hussein's choice may have been shaped by the fact that he wanted to look at a country divided. So Germany, of course, was by then divided. And India, of course, had undergone partition. And there the question of the national culture in times of division would have allowed. And he, of course, travels and he has a lot of other interlocutors. But I think he wanted, he he believed in the historic comparison between India and Germany. Somehow he always felt that India and Germany share something important and a comparative element is important. And even though Spranger thought this text does not make any sense for India, uh, the psychology of youth, by the end of it, he did write a forward to it and he said, I'm now convinced that sometimes the best comparisons are in completely unrelated category and therefore the text can reveal something. So Hussein retains a connection with both German language through his translation work, but also with German intellectual tradition. Uh, he made at least a third visit in the 70s uh, before, before his death when he started this tour on uh, setting up of the Islam in so the third person I've looked at is Anamir Ishmael, among others. So I would call it an uh, interest in comparative element of Hussein's intellectual formation. And could you please identify yourself? I would like to write the question. Uh, my name is Irfan. Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing PhD from AUD. Uh, Raza, my question is related to like Sharar, Abdul Halim Sharar understanding of Khilafat mm -hmm. and how his understanding, like he also emphasized on border thinking and some insecurity elements in, in his fiction work. Mm -hmm. But how do you see, because uh, Abid Hussain also a next generation, Mm -hmm. These understanding of Khilafat and brotherhood or pan-Islamism is, you know, the different or at what level he reached. Hmm. Okay, at the moment of the Khilafat movement itself, Abitsa was a young man. And I think he was actually very apolitical. He was not that politicized. So he, he was extremely studious. He was also an extremely shy person. 
he had also a speech impediment so he would not talk that much so he's a man of words so all you have are his words which is written immensely so what i could gather from hayat abid is uh, that he actually wanted to just study he so he was in alabad then he wanted to go to aligarh and then khilafat start he can't finish his there then he eventually goes to oxford but by then he was in touch with mujib and zakir husain that's where i think the real politicization happens in fact today i read that it's actually in oxford that he reads gandhi and something about gandhi's writing really touches him so then in oxford he leaves oxford to actually go to germany as because he now is convinced we have to give up british colonial thought as not just politically but intellectually so that's the that's his response to khilafat and gandhi his time in germany is fascinating because he's also engaging with all kind of pan islamist actors but he's also interested because he's also engaging with jewish actors he's also interesting because he's engaging with iranian intellectuals so he's a, he's an interesting person because he's not he doesn't have a fidelity to a political ideology he has fidelity to ideas so that's why i would say he the section where i talk about false internationalism uh, under communist internationalism it's precisely the point he might also say about khilafat uh i would imagine him to be interested in an intellectual dialogue rather than political project of that i don't think he would have actually been supportive of khilafat as a political model he would be interested in its internationalism he also actually wrote and he has published so much that it's difficult to keep up i just found out he translated the lecture of the turkish scholar khalid edeb into urdu so i have to read that i think that would reveal something else on his take he would be completely for the i think he would support the the secularist project in turkey so in that sense i i doubt he would have been a huge favor of khilafat as a political form so uh yeah so so uh since you smith's name also you know mm-hmm. you discussed him uh, in relation with the uh, hussein sir so i'm i'm really uh, i mean i i wonder uh, if we also bring in like professor intiaz ahmed you uh-huh. know uh, because in his writings he always refers to uh, uh, smith intiaz sir yeah okay yeah very frequently so so i wonder like how would have been like his response to uh, the writings of uh, abid hussain or has he any anywhere you know uh, engaged with his writings his internationalism and prof timdias ahmed yeah yep okay this i haven't looked at but it's a good point uh he i mean hussain is heavily written in urdu but painfully completely underwritten in english so what i found is mushirul hasan's encyclopedia entry on him in english i found uh one more essay which was written by smith student shila mcdo those are the two one in mainstream english texts in urdu there's a lot of writing uh but those are mostly jamia fresh trip type stuff i haven't i guess it didn't occur to me that mtaz ahmed would be an interesting person in terms of time frame to to catch so i'll note that so i'm not i don't have an answer to that but that's important to perhaps look at how people have responded to him in urdu there is a lot of engagement with his work yeah. what are the people who engage with him in urdu so of course the entire circle around so kg sayed and his brother in law and he has worked closely they actually wrote a textbook for unesco so the, in the fresh script on him uh the article by bashir hussain saidi who actually organized it what was fascinating for me to see in the fresh trip is all the islamic studies major islamic studies scholars like um i want to remember rosenbaum and others these people with german past but in us they have written 
I can't seem to recall the list, but it's actually heavily internationalist. Uh, the Indian name I can recall at the stage is, of course, Zakir Hussain, Mujib Saab. Uh, but I still want to say, actually, I don't think people actually recognize the nature of his work. He's always written as, you know, he's written these books. But his his translation work, which I think is the most interesting one, is not recognized. In fact, most of the time, people don't know that this is a book translated by him. So that bit is not commented upon. And I think some of his best work is in translation. So that I have, when I was looking at the psych, so I would say for the psychology, I want to say Darya Badi at that time. Of course, in opposition, Madhvi Darya Badi would be one uh, because they were in opposition on reading of Freud. I would like to say. So it depends on which text is written. I think in psychology, it would be Daryabadi. In the field of this national culture, I want to say Tara Chan, and I want to say Ziaul Faruqi, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Ziaul Hassan Faruqi. And uh, another person who actually studied with Smith. So there are these set of people. It's betraying my mind, but he's also Jamia Haq. I want to say Mushir Haq. Not Professor Mushirul Haq. He was somebody who worked in Kashmir subsequently. Yeah. Mushir Haq. Mush, Mush, Mushirul Haq. Oh, I'm, yeah, I thought I was thinking, mixing with Mushirul Hazak. Yeah, Mushirul Haq. Though that would be the other person in that domain. Ishtiaq Ahmad Qureshi is, I think, his most engaged critic, though. They are not directly reflecting, although Qureshi is often more combative. So I think he differs. I want to also say that Ashraf is at the backdrop, but Ashraf would, of course, be extremely respectful of Hussein's work. I think in an address, the legal address that he gave to the History Congress, uh, it's not direct, but I, I can, of course, see that it is in dialogue with Mujib Sa's work on Indian Muslims and this book. Uh, so Aziz Ahmed, actually, is another one the Canada-based one. So that's actually, it's it's fascinating says It depends on what text you're reading. For the history one, I would say he has a much diverse audience. For psychology, it's a different set of people. He's also written on philosophy. I'm just starting reading his work on Gandhi, which would be another set of people that he did. So he has a very diverse intellectual circle. Yeah. Any other question or comments? Any messages in the chat? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. If you have questions, yeah. Hmm. It was sense writing. Uh, this is from William. Can't read it this far, probably. Did Hussein's writing feed into the ideas of Islamic socialism hmm. propagated by Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto and the PPP in Pakistan? without the Indian nationalist context. And then there is a second question by Deepak, uh, whether Sayyid Abid Hussain met Hamid Dalwai or saw his work and made any comment on Dalwai. So I don't think so. Uh, whether there is some connection between his work and Dalwai's work, because Dalwai work is actually wrote in Marathi. Yeah. And then the book was translated into English, which very very I don't think yeah. I agree with the latter one. I haven't seen any reference yeah. to that. No, because no. the why actually these were speeches delivered by him and mm. one interview in the book Muslim Politics in India came out and it was a translation. Uh, Dalwai wrote it originally in Marathi. Yeah. But you can answer the first question. Which was on Islamic socialism. Yes. I want to say no. Unless I... You know, there's a Jamia branch in Pakistan too, which is fascinating because one section of Jamia founders moved there and they actually kept the name. So that would be interesting to see if there is a traffic between these two branches. Uh, unfortunately, even if you move locations, it's hard to get a Pakistani visa these days. So I haven't been able to track that. But 
I do know that in Karachi University Islamic Studies Department, I was interested in comparing the Islamic Studies Department in Karachi University because it was also funded by Rockefeller Foundation. So it would have been interesting to sort of compare it. But uh, his work, of course, is heavily there in Ishtia Qureshi. And Qureshi was very much, not till Zia ul though, but he was very much involved in Pakistani state institution building. So it it is known in Pakistan, but I don't think it fed into those debates back then. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, if not, then I have yes. a few comments Please. to make. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. This is actually fascinating to listen to you in great detail. Uh, <clears throat> two set of questions, yes. rather comments. Uh, and I don't think that uh, this is for you, but this is for all of us to think. Uh, I think that uh, first is a conceptual set of issues. Mm. Uh, your use of the term national and secular requires some more qualification. Because Why I'm saying this? Because of two reasons. One reason is the context. Mm -hmm. In the context when Abid Hussain was writing, the national was something was the dominant vocabulary of intellectual current yes. at that time. Secular was not there. In fact, you mentioned that with regard to Musharrullahs in the 90s. Mm -hmm. In the 90s, secular became the dominant vocabulary by you express the elements of that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that yeah. was actually the template by which you can express mm -hmm. all sort of ideas, which Abid Hussain was saying in a different way, yes. while Musharraf mm -hmm. uh, Hussain was making a very different set of arguments. Yeah. So I think it would be very important to make right. this distinction clear. And mm -hmm. this will help you, in my view, to qualify the meaning of secularism in Indian context, because mm -hmm. you also refer it time and again to the concept of minority. Mm -hmm. uh, in what ways the idea of secular is inextricably linked to the Western notion of secular in the mm -hmm. writing of someone like who is actually very much invested mm -hmm. uh, in the idea of national culture. Mm -hmm. So that is one sort of thing which I think very important. Uh, just to you know uh, qualify this further, Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that there, there was a lot of emphasis in the 50s and 60s, especially in 60s, early 60s, on emotional integration of India. Mm -hmm. And there was a committee set up uh, mm -hmm. that was called Emotional Integration of India, the committee to mm -hmm. you know promote emotional integration of India. Yeah. But there was another committee around that time. And the name of the committee was uh, uh, Role of Religious Values in Education. It's that was, I think, in 1963 or 64. Yeah. Now, when that committee came out, A.R. Desai wrote a critical article on that. And he said that, you know, religion and secularism are two different things. Mm -hmm. Now, in that context, the figure of Abid Hussain became very central. Yeah. It is national or secular. If it is, it is secular, then what kind of secular is it? Mm -hmm. So, therefore, we need to qualify. Uh, the, this the, this is actually the first conceptual uh, yeah. issues which I thought uh, I should highlight. But the second uh, thing is, the second set of comment is basically about the context. Uh, these are contextual things, especially with regard to intellectual culture mm -hmm. of the 50s and 60s. And you find an interesting relationship between, say, Azad's writing, mm -hmm. later writing of Azad, Sayyid Mahmood, Abid Hussain, and uh, uh, Ali Mia Nadvi. Okay. Ali Mia has a very interesting book that is in Urdu, which is trans later translated Islam in India. Now he's also making, and if you go back to his autobiography, you find that he started a tehreek called Pegham Insaniyat. Now Pegham Insaniyat also making very similar kind of argument. Now mm -hmm. if we combine all these three, Mm -hmm. I think three very identifiable yeah. intellectual norms can be identified. One is that there is something called the contribution of minorities. Mm -hmm. That Muslim actually, especially Muslims, as a minority, they contribute it intellectually as well as yeah. in different sphere of life. Mm -hmm. So therefore, that uh, contribution made India what yeah. India is. Yeah. And therefore, in the future, the destiny argument yeah. is 
that nation building project again nation nation is central yeah. nation building project is inextricably linked to the contribution thesis of the muslims mm -hmm. so taj mahal would become a symbol of that contribution urdu would become a symbol of that contribution etc mm -hmm. but that was the wrong the norm mm -hmm. so whenever you make an intellectual argument you remind that there was something called a contribution that was the first intellectual norm if mm -hmm. you you find in writings of azad hussein nadvi they all are making very similar arguments mm -hmm. the second is that they would represent the idea of minority as a homogeneous entity mm -hmm. they were not interested in uh, you know evoking the idea of heterogeneity and that's why uh, the figure of imtiaz ahmed is very relevant here. Mm -hmm. because imtiaz was, was emphasizing the fact that we we should yeah. get rid of the idea of homogeneous homogeneity not merely in sociological terms but also in historical terms he said that the history the burden of history should be removed yeah. and some sort of a here and now must yeah. be studied of indian muslims so therefore uh, i think that that yeah. homogeneity thesis was the second intellectual norm in the writing of these yeah. these figures in the 50s and 60s not 70s mm -hmm. and that's the reason why when someone like mushirul hasan would come in into the picture mushirul hasan on the one hand would say that i stick to the idea of diversity mm -hmm. heterogeneity but when it comes to the big picture mm -hmm. he would take refuge in the idea of homogeneity mm -hmm. so that is his problem and that's why some somehow we find that his argument are misleading in some senses now the third intellectual norm uh, which in my view is important is the strong adherence to the idea of legal language they all were somehow relating themselves to the legality uh, of the minority mm -hmm. so they, there is an emphasis on that yeah. time and again they would you know take us back to the idea of legality and that's why the reference point is always not directly to the constitution but the norms by which a constitution came into existence yeah. so that's why the dedication yeah. question yeah. which you were raising yeah. is somehow makes sense yeah. that you know obviously iqbal sare jahan se acha is fine yeah but when it comes to iqbal of that speech the great speech yeah. of 30s then it would become very important to accommodate in the frame which is providing in the 50 uh, in the in, in the post 50 period so this is not directly with the constitution yeah. but the norms which are accepted so yeah. these three intellectual currents i think yeah. uh, would be helpful to make yeah. sense of the larger uh, argument you are making Yeah. but i really enjoy it thank you thank you um, so those are very productive con uh, suggestion i'm re it's just a draft actually spending just a week in jamia there's something about just being physically there that makes you actually relook at your material so i'm actually trying to do maybe add two section one is looking at the debate around the mosque on the campus mm -hmm. and 